Hey, Sting and Kenny, squeaky chairs notwithstanding. <laughs> Welcome to Dallas. It's nice to have you both here. And uh, I want to tell you just straight away that I have seen the picture, Bring on the Night. I enjoyed it very much. It's a very different kind of picture for a band to make. And um, I hope it does well. It'll be opening here, I guess, as you know, on November the 8th. So uh, that probably is enough of that three shot. And now, Dominic, if you want to zoom in to Sting. And when we're set on that shot, I shall continue the conversation with Sting. And um, nice, easy zoom. Very nice. OK. All right. As I watched the film, Sting, I wondered, and it was, I think that it says something good for the film, the fact that I feel I must ask you this question, how much of it was actually written, staged, and how much of it was cinema verite and true documentary style? It was 100% cinema verite, to such an extent that I was worried sick during the filming, whether we had anything, because at the time it seemed like utter chaos. We were trying to do two things at once. One was rehearse a band, a real band, for a real performance at the end of the week. And we were also making a film about it. Now, both of those things take time and energy. And I was between those two things, and I looked like a man in trouble in this film. I was under so much pressure, because uh, the filmmakers wanted to go over things again and again and again, as is their tradition. Musicians wanted to, to, to do the whole show. By the, you know, by the end of the rehearsal period, we hadn't actually done the whole show yet. So we were under-rehearsed, and it's very rough. But at the same time, that tension and that feeling of panic is something that added to the, to the atmosphere of the film. So I was very relieved when I saw the movie the other night for the first time, when uh, it, it seemed to work and it had a, a sort of uh, integrity, a whole. And about how many feet of film did they shoot? Do you have any idea? Well, because it was a documentary, because we had three cameras working constantly, we used three times as much footage as a feature. So you can imagine how much money was being spent. And uh, as this whole thing was my whim, I was feeling very responsible and very sheepish that uh, perhaps we were wasting money hand over fist. But I'm glad to say we weren't. I think I'm very pleased with the film. I think it's unique. And uh, I'm very proud of it. Did you put up the money? No. <laughs> no, I did not. As we say, your mom didn't raise any dumb kids. Huh? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, what was the total cost then? Um, by by film standards, it was fairly fairly cheap. It cost just over two million to actually film. The advertising costs are something else, but um, it was fairly easy. There were no big stars to pay, and uh, except for me, and I was very cheap. And so uh, we, we, we kept costs down, but it still was a very expensive week, you know, it was... Uh, was it all done in one it week? It was a, a week to ten days, yeah. That's incredible. That really is. And we shot everything. We shot everything in our lives that week. Now, had you not been doing the film, would you have been rehearsing in a French chateau? No. I, I, chose, I chose Paris because of its uh, photogenic quality for a start. Um, it was also a neutral environment. I didn't want to do it in England or America because the reaction would have been uh, predictable. And the French are the most difficult audience to play to because they're so critical and very analytical and cold, and the Parisians especially so. So that was just another risk factor. I thought without risk, this film would have been nothing. And it's, it's about taking risks and pulling them off. What was it that gave you the, the original inspiration for you working with jazz musicians, American jazz musicians. I like the idea of, um, of chaos, of um, <laughs> introducing disparate elements that, that cause chaos, and then you, you get creativity out of it. I think to make an album with uh, musicians like myself would have been a certain kind of thing. To take musicians from a different area and ask them to go somewhere else, because I was making a journey a musical journey. I wanted them to make a musical journey so that we both would end up in a country that neither of us were necessarily familiar with. And I think that's what we've achieved. We've, we've, we've made music that isn't jazz, but nor is it rock and roll. It doesn't have a label. And for me, that is a uh, success. How many jazz musicians did you audition? Well, I, to audition uh, the, the standard of musician, is, is, it's a misnomer. You don't audition these kind of people. I had what, what's called a workshop in New York City 
and I um, had an open invitation to the jazz community to come and play, and I played with a, a lot of a lot of people, and I think at the end of the week I uh, I played with uh, the best, and I think I chose the best not only because of their musical abilities but because of their personalities, because I was already thinking about casting a movie. And so I ended up with a very extraordinary bunch of individuals who were also brilliant musicians. So uh, I think I'm pretty good at casting movies. All right, if we may now, Dom, um, move over to Kenny here and get him in this conversation. Kenny, I, I'm curious to know, what did you think the first time that you heard that Sting wanted to listen to jazz musicians in that workshop? What, what was going through your mind? Well, I didn't think of it, you know, very importantly at first because, you know, people always tell you that these, like, great opportunities are going to come up, but they never do. So I just said, when it happens, it happens. But when it did happen, you know, I was really into it. I had been playing jazz a lot before that, and I wanted to check out another, you know, different kind of music, you know. And I've already re al always respected Sting and the police. I was great fans of them, so to get the chance to play with Sting was a great opportunity for me. But you've played with some great jazz musicians, my goodness, from Dizzy Gillespie and when Marsalis and all kinds of wonderful people. Now, what kinds of adjustments did both of you have to make to work together and bring this music together? Well, uh, my roots in music are not in jazz. They're more in pop music anyway. When I grew up, I listened more to pop music and R&B. And that later on, I got into jazz when I turned about 20 years old. I got into jazz. So I always had like a love for that anyway. And I always played it. I played in bands in high school where uh, we played all kinds of music, not only jazz. So the adjustment that I had to make is so it's just like a, it's a whole big world of music. And you just pick what you have to use for a certain thing. That's how I see it, you know. But what were there tempo adjustments? Um, tonal adjustments you know as a musician did, did you you jazz guys get off to one side and say hey we got this and we got that and what what's he doing here and what's he doing there the way i look at it is like a challenge coming off playing with winter marcellus where it's free form and playing crazy and going nuts it's fun but there's a whole another challenge into controlling yourself a whole other discipline to playing a different type of music that's more accessible it's just as much as a challenge to me yeah, yeah. so uh are you saying then that, that you just all kind of melted together and it wasn't any big problem? Well, the band, yeah, Sting was very cool with everybody. And the band, all of us had played together one time or another. And Sting made it real comfortable for us. That's great. Yeah. Okay, let's get back on Sting now. And uh, to carry on our conversation a little bit more about the, um, uh, the band and my gosh you got the album now that's number four in the charts and your concert is coming up here Wednesday night but Sting you've been quoted as saying that this is your temporary band well I don't think I've actually said that I think everything in my life is temporary I don't uh, I don't think about the concept of permanence as being terribly important in my life I live for the moment and if you live for the moment you live for forever in a way and so um, this band will be with me for as long as this band is entertaining to me and entertaining to themselves, just as every other part of my life is, is dispensable. And I, I don't want to sound selfish or cold about it. I think that uh, the, the, major part, the, the, the main thing in my life is freedom and to be free to move wherever one wants without feelings of, of uh, sentimental attachment and I think uh, the great thing about this band is it's musically viable and it's great fun to be in uh, but as soon as it stopped being that then there would be no band and that's how I live my life. Is it realistic to think that you and the police could get back together on some kind of project? It's perfectly realistic. There, There's no timetable as such but um, I st I'm still great friends with, with those people I spend so much of my life with. And so uh, if we, we discovered a new way of presenting our music, we would do it, but we would not make an album or a, a, a record product that was just obeying an old formula because we'd all be bored with it. And if we're bored with it, everyone else would be. So I think you have to constantly think about fresh, new things. Is it possible that we're going to have another album then with this group because number four on the charts, it's doing well, great? Well, we're definitely going to do a live album which is part of uh, our tour. 
and that will come out next year. And then who knows? Who knows? I think uh, I'll always uh, be friends with these guys. I mean, when, when you're in a band with, with people, it's, it, it's like a marriage, basically. You, 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 you get so close, and uh, it's wonderful. But like some marriages, there are often divorces. Some, yes. Well, it's, it's, like, it's like marriage without sex. But we have music <laughs> as a lubricant. <laughs> You have, of course, uh, been an actor in films. In this, you're playing yourself, but you have been in Dune, you have been in The Bride. Currently, you're starring with um, Meryl Streep in Plenty. Is it more difficult to be yourself and to be Sting rather than a character? Um, in a way, I think when, when the camera is on you in a documentary sense where they want to see you, uh, what you have to be very aware of is not to be too self-conscious, in other words, trying to uh, change your behavior for the sake of the camera. Because if you do that, the, cam the camera doesn't lie, the camera's too close. And if you start lying to the camera, it's so obvious, it's so blatantly, patently obvious. And therefore you have to just stay relaxed. On film, as an actor playing parts, I, I always go and see rushes. And I discuss with the director how my performances improve throughout the takes. Um, because that's very important. I never saw any rushes for this movie. I did not want to become self-conscious. I didn't care what I looked like. Um, I just wanted it to be an honest look at, at my life. And it's not a cosmetic film in that sense. It wasn't a, designed to make me look uh, great. If anything, I look tired and exhausted. So uh, I'm fairly confident that, that, that that's what will come out when people see it, an honest look at my, a slice of my life. I keep thinking, Sting, that uh, we're going to see you in a motion picture playing a character where you are the star because I really think you have a tremendous presence in front of the camera and uh, uh, the ability to do characters. Now, when are we going to see that? It's not something that I'm losing any sleep over or anything I'm in a terrible hurry to do. Uh, my vocation is to be a musician and I feel very comfortable doing that. Film is something that uh, I'm interested in learning about. I enjoy working with actors and directors and I want to do it as, as best as I possibly can but if, if the right part comes along then it comes along. If it doesn't I, I, I'm all right. I, you know I'm not, uh, I've got a lot to do in my life. I'm a busy, <laughs> a busy man. You don't have your agent out shopping for scripts? Oh, my agent is out shopping for scripts because they know they can uh, you know, make a lot of bucks if, if they get the right role for me. But uh, as I say, I'm not losing any sleep over it. One last question, and that is, uh, I, I suspect that, that you're anticipating different reactions to one part of the movie, and that is where your son, Jake, is born, where, where Trudy gives birth. And we're right there in the delivery room, and uh, it's very, I think very nicely done and very tastefully done. But I'm sure, aren't you anticipating that there will be mixed reaction to that? Um, l let me first of all say that th the birth of, of my fourth child was an accident in the sense that you can't time when a baby's born. They come in their own good time. And as the filming only took 10 days, it could have happened on either side of that. I had no intention of using it in the film. At the same time, if, if I was being honest about making a documentary about my life, here's one of the most profound events in my life. And so we filmed it on the understanding that it was entirely at my discretion whether we included it in the final film or not. So when I saw a rough cut, uh, I was so moved by the scene, and everyone around me felt the same way, that uh, I thought something very special was happening. And it's not just a piece of gratuitous home movie making. It actually means something, particularly with regard to what I'm singing about uh, in the soundtrack. And therefore, I don't regret it. I know it's a private moment, but um, I think it's a very, very profound piece of footage. And I don't uh, have no shame or, or uh, feeling of, uh, I'm not apologetic about it. I think it's, it stands as a, as a wonderful piece of filming. Did the music come after the film was shot, or how did that...? No, no, the music was already done. Uh, it was just we decided to uh, use a particular song called The Russians Love Their Children Too um, underneath this piece of footage, and the, it, the, the two things seemed to complement each other. I thought it was very effective and very moving, quite frankly. That was my reaction to it, but at the same time I could see that there were some people who well, might not think so. They'll always throw stones at, 
that you. <laughs> okay. This is life. Well, uh, pull back now, uh, if you would please, to a three shot. Let me say how much I've enjoyed this. Kenny, nice to have had a chance to meet you and Sting again. I'll tell you, I enjoyed the film. Hope it does well for you. And uh, thank you for giving us this time. You're most generous. Well, Appreciate it. Thank you. Good luck with the concert as well Wednesday night. How many cities are you playing the concert is this tour? Is Last on? night was number 60. And and how many more to go? I would say worldwide about 150, 160. Total? Mm -hmm. 150, 160. Okay, good Lord. When, when is it to end? It will end in April in Australia. But, uh, you know, it's great. You can't complain. I mean, musicians are sitting at home wishing they had one gig. <laughs> uh, now right? then, Definitely. excuse me. Um, does anybody else do an interview, or is this the last that they do? This is the last one. If they wish to go on, I can do these re-asks without them. Can you? Surely. Because we've been here since I know, and that's why I'm saying, uh, I, you know, I talk to walls all, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I talk to walls and wallpaper. <laughs> I mean, it's not my job to do that, but uh, okay, so you don't need to stay on my account. Thank okay, you, Sting. Thank you so much for coming out to speak to you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny. Nice meeting you. Okay, ready. Uh, and then, if you'll get a little wider shot of me, um, let me see, uh, cutting about something like that ought to be okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. We're dressing it up so it won't be trashed. Okay. And oh, not at all. I mean, uh, should I get out of the chair? I just stay here. Sure, not at all. Uh, just clear it with the control room. Okay, we're still rolling. Stand by, please. Uh, quiet on the floor. You mind sitting there for me, baby? Sit, just sit there for me. Just sit there for me. No, no, I don't need you to sit there, All right. really. All right, geez. <laughs> I prefer not. Okay. Stand by. Get out, Doug. Get out. Get out, Doug. That's fine. That's fine. Stand by. Sting, how much of the movie was actually scripted and staged, and how much of it was cinema verite and documentary style? Let, let's wait till the background noise settles down, because that, okay. All right. All right. Okay. Did you use more than one camera? Do you have any idea how much film was shot? If you were not making this movie, would you have been rehearsing in a French chateau? Why did you decide to set it in Paris? How many jazz musicians did you audition anyway? Uh, okay. Um, you have been quoted as saying that this is a temporary band. Is it realistic to believe that you and the police could get back together on some kind of project? The scene in the movie where Trudy gives birth to your son, Jake, do you, th let me start over. 
I, I suspect that you will get different reactions uh, to the scene in the movie where Trudy gives birth to your son, Jake. What are you anticipating in that regard? Quite upset. Okay. Do you find it more difficult to play yourself than to play a character? When are we going to see Sting as the star of a movie? You mean your agents are not shopping for scripts? Okay. Um, all right, now I'll look just a little bit this way as if I'm talking to Kenny. No, no, you don't move. No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Didn't mean to frighten you. <laughs> okay. All right. But I'm from here now to here. Okay. Kenny, what kinds of adjustments did you jazz musicians have to make when you started working with Sting? Weren't there, though, some kinds of adjustments, either tempo or tone or...